Um, I'm super excited to, to chat with you all today. I'm Cody Coleman, and I'm really excited to share my research on how careful data selection can make ML development faster, cheaper, and better by focusing on quality rather than quantity. So again, the unprecedented amount of available data has been critical to many of deep learning's recent successes. But this big data brings its own problems. It's computationally demanding, resource hungry, and often redundant. So we waste a lot of time, money, and just energy on data points that aren't actually valuable. But if we're instead careful about the data points that we actually choose to label and train on, we can save valuable resources. And just to give a sense of um, like how costly uh, uh, this data can be and getting it wrong, um, let's look at speech recognition. Annotation at a word level can actually take 10 times longer than the, the audio clip. And if we do finer grain annotations, it can take up to 400 times as long. Even for simple tasks like information extraction, locating entities and relations can take a half an hour or more, even for simple news stories. And this is just the time that it goes into labeling a single example. Trying to figure out what examples to label is another massive problem where we spend a lot of time and resources actually kind of figuring out how to curate the, the data set. So the kind of key problem is here, how can we efficiently, uh, efficiently identify the most informative training examples? And we're in luck. There's a long kind of history of research and under active learning and course set selection, um, which has developed methods that just that, that focus specifically on that, quantifying and identifying the most informative training points. However, there's an asterisk here when we think about kind of modern big data uh, data sets. But I'll get to that in a minute. First, what is active learning? The goal of active learning is to select the best examples to improve model quality. And this is done through an iterative process where we start with a large amount of unlabeled data. And then we take a, a, a small subset of that that we label either chosen at random or maybe it's given to us. And we train a model on that subset. Now, this is where the interesting bit happens. We take that model and some selection strategy or criteria to quantify the informative of, uh, informativeness of examples. And we apply that to all of the unlabeled data. And then we can actually um, select the examples that have the kind of most, uh, that are the most informative or the most valuable for us to label. We can label those and we can expand our labeled set. And then we can repeat the process where we train a model and this new updated model um, that has used this kind of better data, um, we can repeat this process of applying it to all of the unlabeled data um, and, uh, and selecting the best examples to label until we've exhausted some um, labeling criteria or other constraints at which point we can train the model one last time on all of the data that we've collected so far. And active learning is a really powerful data selection technique for reducing labeling costs. But when we think about deep learning and modern uh, data workloads, it can be computationally expensive. Um, for example, if we think about this iterative process, retraining a deep learning model after every single step or every iteration um, can be extremely expensive which limits um, how many iterations we can do or the frequency that we can do those iterations. And then when we think about kind of modern data sets with millions or billions uh, potentially of unlabeled examples, actually scanning over all of the unlabeled data can be a, a massive computational bottleneck. So today I wanna to talk about two pieces of, of research that kind of address these, um, uh, these computational bottlenecks and constraints. Um, first, the selection by a proxy, which appeared in iClear 2020, uh, and I was super fortunate to work with amazing researchers uh, from Stanford on this. Um, and then second, we'll talk about similarity search for efficient active learning and search for rare concepts, which I had the pleasure of working with folks from uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, as well as Facebook, and this work appeared uh, in AAAI 2020. But starting with selection by a proxy, uh, and going back to this kind of setup that we, that we discussed, Selection by a proxy tries to address the computational expense that's associated with training these um, kind of large deep learning models at every iteration. Now, the key insight that we exploit in, in selection by a proxy is um, that actually small models can provide very useful signal for selecting data points. So here in this plot, we actually took um, a, a variety of um, model architectures and sizes um, uh, trained on ImageNet and we calculated how correlated their rankings were to one another. And we found that actually there's very, very high ranking correlation across many different models. So if we were to select the, the best examples from one model, it's very likely that that would be a good set of examples for us to label for another model. So 
we can actually exploit this by taking small, less accurate models and using them as inexpensive proxies during the data selection process. And we call this approach selection by a proxy. So the surprising thing is that even though these models are smaller and less accurate, the data that they, they provide useful signal for selecting data. And um, once we take the final kind of selected data set um, and we train our kind of larger, more accurate model on it, we actually find that they reach the same accuracy. But this allows us to accelerate data selection by uh, data selection and active learning by close to 42x. So massive improvement, allowing us to scale to data sets that we couldn't um, uh, uh, efficiently train on or work with before. So to actually kind of quantify this um, and see, did we actually pick useful examples? Um, we evaluated our approach on a number of large scale um, uh, 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 data sets. So first, starting with CIFAR 10, um, here we have the x-axis represents the amount of data that we've labeled so far, so our labeling budget. Um, and then our y-axis is top one test error for a model that we're training. The dashed gray line represents the performance that we get if we train on the entire data set. Um, and then the black line represents what we get if we were just to take a random subset of that certain percentage of data. And the interesting thing, if we, we do active learning, traditional active learning with a, with a very accurate model like ResNet 164, we see that it's accurate and we can actually get to um, basically the same level of accuracy with 50% of the data by doing this active learning technique where it would take us um, all 100% of the data to do that with random sampling. So we're getting a 2x improvement in data efficiency. However, this process is really slow. Alternatively, if we were to use a smaller model like ResNet 20, which is much faster to train, uh, about eight times faster to train, um, we can actually do this process relatively quickly, but ultimately we can see by the dashed blue line that um, the final model's performance isn't, isn't that great. We have a much higher error than we did with ResNet 164. So what we ultimately want is to have the best of both worlds. And luckily, we can actually do that by taking the data that was selected by ResNet uh, 20 and then training ResNet 64 only at the end once we've kind of exhausted our labeling budget. And we find that this yields a 7x speed up without any loss in the final accuracy of ResNet 164, as shown by the overlapping solid blue lines, uh, solid uh, blue and orange lines. And we kind of perf we performed the same experiment on many other data sets um, with other models. So on ImageNet, we see that um, we see very similar results for this larger, more complex data set. Um, here we're using ResNet 18 to select data for a ResNet uh, 50 model. And then on Amazon reviews, um, uh, with several million um, uh, reviews, we actually take a very small, shallow model, fast text, which can be trained in a matter of minutes on a laptop to actually select data for a much larger model, VDCNN 29, which takes hours, close to 16 hours to train on, on, on GPUs. And we find that we can actually speed up the process of data selection by close to 42x while um, allowing VDC and then uh, 29 to achieve effectively the same test error. Now, we're not just limited to, um, to, to uh, figuring out which data points to label in active learning. We can also use this process of selection by a proxy to distill down large labeled data sets. So where might we have these kind of large labeled data sets? So this comes up in practice if you have kind of systematic feedback or feedback from users. So imagine you're tagging images, uh, tagging friends and images on a social media website. You're flagging emails as spam. You're rating um, items or movies on your, your favorite uh, content streaming platform. And also when we think about these kind of large self-supervised models, so things in language modeling like BERT or GPT or in uh, computer vision like CINCLR and Dino, we effectively turn all of our unlabeled data into uh, 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 training data that we can use, which greatly uh, kind of creates this massive data set that would be awesome if we could distill down to kind of some core set. And I don't have time to dive deeply into the results, but we can apply the same idea of uh, selection by proxy to this problem of core set selection, where we effectively take our small proxy model that's quick to train, we can train it on all of our uh, labeled data, and then we can use that model to kind of filter out unnecessary data points and uh, only train our larger kind of more accurate model on that kind of like reduced subset. And we find that even for like fairly balanced um, uh, uh, data sets like CIFAR 10, fairly small and balanced data sets like CIFAR 10, we can still achieve uh, uh, an end-to-end -end training time speed up of uh, 1.6x 
without any loss in accuracy of the final model. And please see our, um, our, our work, our paper selection by a proxy from iClear 2020 for more details on course and selection, as well as all the other kind of data sets and methods that we tried there. Um, now moving on, um, kind of more recent work, um, uh, similar research for efficient active learning and search of rare concepts, kind of takes this idea of trying to really reduce the computational bottlenecks to another degree. So let's imagine that we're at a really large scale, really large scale company with tremendous amounts, like billions of unlabeled examples. So this might come up if we're a social media site and we're trying to do a recommendation. And imagine that you, like something new happens that you wanna identify. So for example, in like 2015, fidget spinners were all of the rage. Um, now you're in luck because you have a lot of unlabeled or weekly um, labeled data. So there must be many more examples there for you to kind of pull on to actually create a robust classifier. The problem is that is actually finding them. They only represent a very small percentage of your overall data. Um, and this same type of problem where you have a very skewed data set and a tremendous amount of unlabeled data comes up. Uh, I've seen this come up over and over again. So for example, and working with folks in autonomous vehicles, um, they actually have this problem when they're trying to debug a model for an autonomous vehicle. So imagine that you're um, an autonomous vehicle company with a fleet of vehicles and you notice that your car is getting stuck behind delivery trucks because it can't tell a delivery truck from a normal truck. What you would want to go, what you would want to do in order to solve that problem is actually go find um, uh, data for delivery trucks so that you can build a classifier and plan around it so that you can move around delivery trucks. And this comes up all the time. So things like occluded stop signs, as well as debris on the road, all these edge cases only appear in a fraction of the overall data, um, which is kind of like a needle in the haystack problem. And finally, we can imagine from an integrity standpoint. So imagine that we're a long e-commerce, uh, a large e-commerce platform where we have a tremendous amount of different posts and items that are being sold. But if we go back to the beginning of the pandemic, um, there was a shortage of N95 masks, and it was socially unacceptable and illegal in, uh, in places to actually sell N95 masks because of the shortage of a supply. In that case, you really quickly want to be able to create like a robust classifier so that you can um, identify N95 masks and take down postings on that so that you can kind of disincentivize people from posting them and reserve the supply for the people that really need it. So in all these cases, um, doing, doing active learning, as, as we kind of laid out before, uh, will help us actually identify those best examples to improve our model out of this massive pool of unlabeled data that, uh, uh, that we have. Um, but when we think about billions of unlabeled examples, now the bottleneck becomes just actually processing all of the unlabeled data, actually going through all of it to quantify its informativeness and uh, label it. And many active learning uh, uh, strategies are linear in terms of the uh, unlabeled data. And um, many others are actually quadratic, making it really, really hard to scale to these large data sets. So for example, even if you had to do kind of a linear approach, simple uncertainty sampling, running a single inference pass over 10 billion images with a ResNet 50 model would be about 40 exaflops or roughly 40 GPU months which means that just evaluating all these unlabeled examples is effectively too slow and intractable for, for many users and use cases, especially when we wanna do it multiple times in a process like active learning to, to be able to adapt to the data that we're getting back. Now, the key insight um, that we had in, in, in kind of solving this is that we actually noticed that unseen concepts are actually well clustered by pre-trained models, um, pre-trained deep learning models or foundation models um, and effectively in the latent space, they form kind of tight clusters um, for these unseen concepts um, that are very well connected components. So in these two plots, we actually um, calculated the largest connected component based off of the K nearest neighbor graph for different values of K, and we plotted the CDF. And what we can see is that both for ImageNet and Open Images, the majority of classes actually form these kind of very large connected components that have um, over uh, six, uh, over 80% of the data if you have a sufficiently large um, value of K. So what this means is if we kind of visualize this, if we kind of think about a simple example, when we think about the latent space, um, these data points actually kind of have clusters together where your K nearest neighbors uh, for a single concept might be very um, close to, uh, to one another in a connected component as shown in red. Now what this means is that we actually don't need to look at all of the unlabeled data. 
most of the data for a single concept, if we're thinking about N95 masks or delivery trucks or, or anything like that, is actually only represents a very small fraction of this latent space. So we don't actually need to look at all of the unlabeled data. And we can instead start with the closest examples to kind of the seed set that we originally have, and then expand that candidate pool over time as we label more examples. And this, uh, this insight led to our approach, uh, similarity search for efficient active learning in search of rare concepts. And in this approach, we kind of start off in the same way. So we have a large amount of unlabeled data um, and we have some initial labeled subset that's given to us and we train a model on that initial subset. But instead of applying our selection strategy to all of the unlabeled data, we, uh, we use similarity search to find the closest examples and we only consider that. And then from the, that kind of like small candidate pool, we select the best examples uh, within that neighborhood to label. And then we update our labeled set and we repeat this process. Um, and then we take those newly labeled examples um, and we find their nearest neighbors to expand the candidate pool and the unlabeled data and repeat this process. And then at the end, we've actually only looked at a very small fraction of the unlabeled data. But surprisingly, we find that the final model still achieves the same predictive performance. So this means that we only need to process a small fraction of the data, speeding up the process kind of end to end uh, while getting the same accuracy. Um, and to evaluate this um, uh, and to see, did we actually focus on the right examples in the right part of the lane space? We evaluated this on a number of large, uh, large scale data sets. So here the X axis is the number of labels. The Y axis is our mean average precision for a, a subset of classes. The gray dashed line represents uh, the, the performance that we get with su uh, full supervision. And then if we look at like random sampling or passive learning, we see that you know, with, with 2000 labels, we actually don't get to a reasonably high accuracy. Um, but if we were to do something like max entropy uncertainty sampling over all of the data, we can very quickly get to the, to the uh, close to full supervision with just a very small fraction of the data, a huge gap in comparison to random sampling, which dramatically reduces the kind of data efficiency or dramatically improves the data efficiency and reduces the cost that we have for labeling um, as well as training. However, this process is slow because again, we're scanning over all of the data. But if we apply our SEALS method, um, what we find is actually that we're, uh, real, we realize a very similar level of quality in terms of mean average precision, but we only end up considering less than 10% of the unlabeled data. So this actually enables us to get a 5x speed up for a simple linear approach like uncertainty sampling and up to 50x speed up for kind of larger or for more complex methods like information density. And as we increase the size of the data set, so open images, and at the time of, 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 of this work, it had um, 3.8 million examples that were available. We find that once again, SEALs achieves a very similar kind of mean average precision, but now we actually only need to look at 1% of the unlabeled data. So now even a baseline approach like max, uh, max entropy uh, has a 50x speed up. And then once we get to kind of more complex methods that scale uh, quadratically or close to quadratically, we can get three orders of magnitude speed ups in comparison to them. And finally, to really test this, to really kind of put this at scale, we, uh, uh, we, took, we created a data set of 10 billion images from a social media platform uh, from a large internet company. Um, and we applied SEALs to that. And we found that once again, that the SEALs method um, achieves a very similar mean average precision to kind of the baseline approach that scale scans over all of the data, but we only need to look at less than 0.1% uh, of the unlabeled data. And what this means is like in practice, um, when we ran this method, we needed a cluster of machines in order to do like a single pass. Um, but with SEALs, we could actually do it on a, a single dev machine, on a single uh, uh, personal computer. And this, this is amazing because it, 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 basically by, we can improve the computational efficiency of data selection with method, you know, methods like selection by proxy and seals. And that allows us to create data sets and models in minutes rather than days or weeks, even on web scale data sets with billions of examples, enabling agile ML development and allowing humans and uh, machines to work together more efficiently and quickly. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Cody, for that excellent presentation. Uh, seeing a lot of appreciation in the chat. And then we have a bunch of Q&A also popping up. So 
um, awesome. ask you a couple of questions. Um, so the first one that popped up uh, is in the similarity search, how do you decide on your candidate pool? Yeah, that's a great question. So in the similarity search, what we're doing is we're taking kind of that labeled set that we, um, and I'll go back in the slides. We're taking that labeled set um, that we have after each round. We're finding the nearest neighbors of that those labeled data points in the unlabeled data. And um, we're effectively to kind of keep the computation of the similarity search down, we're using an approximate K nearest neighbors algorithm, um, which can scale to billions of examples uh, with sub-second latency. Got it, thank you. I guess related to that, um, well, related to the similarity search, uh, Daniel asks, will similarity search-based sampling strategy make it even more difficult to properly learn rare classes of the data set? Yeah, this is a great question. So. So kind of what we found and uh, kind of going back to this kind of key insight, um, rare, rare concepts actually we find are actually fairly well clustered in the data as we kind of get better and better representations, um, especially when we think about these foundation models, when we think about kind of search in general, um, they're meant to create these representations that kind of create a, a very nice latent structure, which makes things very easy downstream. I mean, this is why when we think about kind of like Papers like GPT uh, GPT two, where they kind of say these large language models are effectively few shot learners. That's partially because of the fact that we can actually create um, the examples are in a space which makes it very easy to separate and to classify. So, um, but of course there are edge cases where there's ambiguous things. So imagine um, in open images, for example, there's like a class called electric blue. Electric blue can appear in many different things. Um, and that can actually be kind of a difficult example because it's spread over the entire space. But for things that are very kind of visually obvious that the representation picks up well, um, they're actually very well clustered. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. People are very excited about the clustering approach. So another question is, you know, the K-means algorithm is a part partitioning, not a clustering technique. Have you tried other clustering approaches like bona fide clustering approaches such as dbscan uh, been tried on such large data sets? Thank you. Uh, that's the question. So it's like, have you tried, I guess, other clustering approaches um, other than Q-means and, and how that impacts this entire process? Oh, yeah. So that's a great, a great question. We're we're not exactly using K-means. We're using um, uh, the partitioning technique rather than, um, yeah, we're not exactly using the K-means algorithm. We're using more of like a, a K-nearest neighbors approximate algorithm. Um, just to be able to get this kind of very quick look up for a single data point to find its nearest neighbors. We actually don't want to cluster through everything if we like don't have to. Um, and just by being able to actually kind of find the nearest neighbors, which is a, a slightly different problem than kind of true clustering, um, that's where we get our, our benefit because we can effectively explore this, this K nearest neighbors graph going kind of one edge at a time, almost in kind of like a traditional like search algorithm or things like that, where we use the model's uncertainty to direct us. So it's a slightly different setup than kind of uh, maybe a more traditional clustering algorithm, uh, algorithm or approach, where really the, the speed and the fact that like uh, search, similarity search is very well optimized at large scale since it's a backbone application, we can actually exploit that to, to make this processing really fast. Makes sense. So it's optimized for the problem that you're trying to tackle, which is trying to work with this really, really large unlabeled data set. And then, um, yeah, a great question. Um, Sort of around that, um, I guess people are curious just about like the robustness and, and dealing with the rare classes, things like that. So just questions around like, have you checked this against um, out of domain distribution generalization or robustness data set or metrics? Just curious about that trade off here when you are sampling sort of the nearest neighbors. I know you sort of touched on this um, previously, but but sort of, yeah, any thoughts around do are these models still as robust or do they still generalize well? Um, as part of your evaluation process? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, if, if the data is out of distribution for kind of the embedding model that you use or the, the algorithm that you're, um, I guess the representation that you're using for similarity search, then you can run into problems. So I, I, I believe in the paper we had kind of one case of this with like Goodreads. Um, where we use a traditional sentence BERT model that's kind of trained um, in a traditional way. Um, and so it's going to it's going to basically classify content or it's going to cluster content together that are kind of similar themes in a sense. Um, 
But then the task that we wanted to do with Goodreads was to detect if a, a, a review was a spoiler or not. So it's actually kind of a very different distribution of data and different problem effectively than what the original embedding model and similarity search was trained on. And in that case, it can be a little bit harder to, um, to uh, have kind of a good distribution and results. So like the robustness is a little bit uh, maybe more difficult there. But in increasingly, as like we get to better representations and things like that, and we can kind of quickly change um, for different tasks, you can imagine kind of improving that um, uh, even for these kind of like different distributions. But that is definitely a problem if your if your similarity search engine was trained on a very different task than uh, kind of like the classifications that you're trying to do. Makes sense. Um... We do have a lot more questions popping in. So I guess I'm just going to say, uh, if people have more questions and there are a bunch, uh, how can they best contact you to ask you more questions after this? Yeah, great question. Yeah, so feel free to email me at Cody at coactive.ai. Uh, that's probably the best way to get in touch with me. So thank you for all the questions. This is an awesome session. Of course. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>